Hey everybody, welcome to the channel, True Crime Stories. If you're new to the channel, please hit that like button and subscribe so you can hear more. Thanks for stopping by. I wanted to share something that I received in an email. Now, I don't know if this is a legit email and if this person that emailed me is really the family member of this missing person. I am trusting that it is, but regardless, this is just something that I wanted to share. This is on the uh, story that I did on the disappearance of Rosanna Miliani from Florida, who came to North Carolina to Bryson City, which is in the Great Smoky Mountains, and she disappeared. It was believed, and some people still believe, that she was a victim of the Appalachian Trail serial killer, uh, Gary Hilton. Now, whether or not she really was, there's been no proof of that. He has denied it. He took a lie detector test, and they said that there was no deception but keep in mind this is a sociopath who could possibly beat a lie detector but regardless I wanted to share this email I'm not going to say who the person is but I will just say that they sent me this email saying that they were a family member of Rosanna there are some known facts about the last day she was seen in Bryson City First, she visited a local pawn shop and asked about pawning a computer and a ring. According to the pawn shop, she did not pawn anything. I don't know if they didn't offer her enough money that she was hoping to get out of these items or if she was just curious what she might be able to get out of them. I don't know if Rosanna was broke and needed money. I think... Just personally, from what I've seen of her family and, and their interviews that have been done with them over the years, I believe that if she needed money, they would have gladly have sent her the money. I believe they gladly would have gone to North Carolina to get her and bring her home. So I don't know if it was just the fact that she needed money or didn't want to ask her family. Maybe she didn't want them to know that she wanted this money and then the second thing is she visited a local bank and asked about opening a bank account she was told she would need a local address so I don't know if she established that I don't think that she did I don't think that she opened a bank account next she visited a local beauty salon and um, she I guess while she was there, she got her hair trimmed. And while she was there, she asked about a place to store her belongings. She was told about a local storage place across from the beauty shop. And she went there. The owner of the place took her in his car to another storage. Now, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me why this man would do this and who he was and if the police interviewed him. But it just says that the owner of the place took her in his car to another storage unit located on the outskirts of town. Then this is where she left her belongings. Up to this point, there are witnesses that can prove all of these facts. After that, the owner of the shop stated that he dropped her off in downtown Bryson City but this is where the private detective that was helping on the case could not find any witnesses to this particular fact. So there's speculation that this owner of this, um, or manager, if he was the owner or the manager of this storage unit, gave her a ride to a different storage unit outside of Bryson City, 
She put her belongings in there, and then she left with this man. He says he dropped her off in downtown Bryson City, and this is kind of where things end. Now, so this is kind of where everything came to an end with Rosanna. She was never seen or heard from again after that. And her belongings, as far as the family knows, are still in the custody of the police in Asheville, North Carolina. Bryson City is a very small town. I've been there myself. It, it's a very quaint little Mayberry-like town. Um, keep in mind it is surrounded by the vast Great Smoky Mountains National Park. People come there from all over the world. They come there from all over to hike the Appalachian Trail, to hike and to visit the Great Smoky Mountains. Um, so it's it's untelling who Rosanna may have encountered while she was there. Now, this says that she went missing in 2005. So I'm sure that there were cameras around the town at that time. Were there cameras around the storage unit? And I don't know. But she's still a missing person. And I just wanted to share that because I want people to know that these families, if this is indeed a family member of hers, um, they don't ever stop looking for their family members. They don't ever stop um trying to find them. Um, I just wanted to share that, and I just want people to know that she's still out there, and she's still missing, and if this is her family member, I would just say to them, I'm sorry that this is going on in your life, and I hope that someday your family gets answers to what happened to her. This is dated... December 21st, 2020. Code Case Files. What happened to Samuel Dickey Riser 10 years ago in Kanawha County, West Virginia? This December the, marks 10 years since an eastern Kanawha County coal miner was last seen alive. And while investigators do have a person of interest in the case, they don't have enough evidence to secure an arrest. Samuel Richard Riser, who went by Dickey, was last seen December 8, 2010. He was 60 years old and was last seen at his home on the 300 block on 3rd Avenue in Glasgow. We learned on December the 8th he had some activity on some bank accounts, some phone records. There are some things in his house that we found that would indicate that he was still in his house on December 8th, said Sher Kanawha County Sheriff's Office Chief of Detectives, Lieutenant Sean Snuffer. Everything that we feel led to this disappearance may have occurred on late December 8th or December 9th. Eyewitness News has interviewed his sister, Linda Barnett, and her daughter, Michelle White, several times since his disappearance. They pressed for answers in his disappearance and made pleas for someone to come forward with information that would lead to his body being found and arrest being made. Barnett has since passed away with no developments in the case that would bring closure. There have been no updates. It's just been a dead end. Barnett also talked about his love of singing and country music. Eyewitness News spoke with White, who was his niece, in 2012, when she said what bothered her the most was that my kids, when they get upset, they don't understand what happened. He was gone my whole adult life, and he just had moved back here. My kids were just getting to know him, and they never will. To this day, his body has not been found. It's a mystery that only haunts this family. Right now, we have exhausted all leads in this case. We currently have some individuals of interest we are still looking at, but as of right now, this is all, said Lute uh, Lieutenant Snuffer. The person of interest in the case has never been publicly identified. 
detectives have kept many of the details guarded over the years. All we know is that he didn't show up for work. They happened to realize he hadn't been at work for a couple of days, so they got a hold of his landlord, and the landlord went inside the residence. Once inside, they found that his TV was on, and some lights were also on, and that was odd. Detectives said they discovered blood inside the home that was enough to indicate that there may have been some sort of altercation. Also of note, nothing was reported stolen from the house, and a large amount of cash was still inside of the house. So it wasn't robbery. Um, his car was sitting outside. We think this was personal. We think this was a crime of some type of passion or some type of personal altercation that happened. We think he knew the person that came inside the house and possibly had even invited them in. A mo no motive um, has been released. We know that he was involved with a female in the community, and we have looked into that. We don't feel that he was involved in anything illegal. He was not known to have been involved in any kind of narcotics or anything of that nature. Investigators say that their leads have been exhausted. We have got numerous leads. We've got maps. They've conducted some searches with cadaver dogs. There's been abandoned mines that we've gone into and searched. We've searched the area where water is located. Um, detectives sympathize with the family in their fight for answers, and they share their frustration. If somebody will call us with one lead that would lead to somewhere, Samuel Riser had just paid his December rent and mailed out a letter. Then he disappeared. The 61-year-old West Virginia man has not been seen or heard from since December the 8th, 2010. Blood was discovered in his home during a welfare check after he didn't show up for work. Police went to the scene, and while remaining tight-lipped about the investigation, they acknowledged that they do believe Foul play took a, played a role in his disappearance. Investigators have said publicly that they have received a lot of tips, but they always hit a dead end. They have asked people in the community for any information about this man's whereabouts. Mr. Riser was known to some as Sam or Dickie. He was a hard-working, loving father. His children have been fighting to find their dad. Um... His information has been uploaded to Name Us. He was a white male, six foot to six foot two inches tall, and around two hundred pounds. He was last seen in Canal County, West Virginia. He went missing from his residence on December the eighth after five PM. He had gray hair and he had a full head of hair, a full mustache, and blue eyes. Um, doesn't say he had any tattoos. He was possibly wearing a blue jean jacket with a gray hoodie. He wore metal rimmed eyeglasses and was possibly wearing white tennis shoes with blue and orange. And he did go missing under mysterious circumstances. Her said that her father would not deliberately have gone missing or anything like that because he was looking forward to seeing her graduate from military school. And um, deputies say inside his home, it was disheveled along with what appeared to be blood spots on the floor. I think someone was hired to kill him, says his son. The family is helplessly numb, knowing the case is still unsolved. Why would someone be hired to kill this man? What would be the end game here? Um, life insurance money? that they would automatically look at family members if that were the case, or the ex-wife, or the wife. I don't know if they were divorced or not. They mentioned that he was known to be seeing a woman. Is it possible that she was at his home that night and someone was targeting him because of her? Could it have been her ex-husband or a boyfriend or someone 
who followed her there, waited for her to leave, and then went inside and confronted him. Um, that's just a scenario, you know. This is from the Kanawha County Sheriff's Office. Samuel Dickey Riser went to work Wednesday, December the 8th, 2010, and returned home. And um, Saturday, December 11, 2010, the family received a call from his employer that he had not been to work since the 8th. They went to his house. His car was there. His door was locked. The TV was on, but he was gone. They say that he was that there was blood in the floor. I, I'm assuming that they took the blood and tested it to see if it belonged to him. It was there anyone else's blood there? They said that the police had been guarded with giving out any information. So if that's the case, maybe they're holding on to that. But if there was someone else's blood there, I'm sure they would have entered it into CODIS to check to see if anyone, you know, had a record. Is it possible, since his door was locked and his car was there, that he left and got into a car with someone else? Is it possible, they said that there was enough blood there for the police to believe that something like an altercation had taken place? Is it possible that he left with someone to go get some help, but instead of getting help, he was taken someplace else? You know, those are just some possibilities. Foul play is suspected. If you think you may have seen him or know anything about this case, please contact Detective D.H. Duff of the Canal County Sheriff's Office or David Duff at kcso.us. Some of these stories of missing and murdered people, you find quite a bit of information to go on. There, there may be many links and there may be many podcasts and videos about them. And others, there may be very little. And this is one where I did not find a whole lot of information. Edward Bartram, who was missing from West Virginia. Although there is hardly any information available about his disappearance, we do know that he was last seen on Regency Road in Mineral City, West Virginia in 2009. He was reported missing on May the 23rd, four days after he was last seen. He has not been seen or heard from since. The lack of information available in this case has led authorities to let this case go cold. Authorities considered his disappearance suspicious, but they also say that they just didn't have any information to go on. He was also listed as a wanted person. He had warrants out for transferring and receiving stolen property and a parole violation. At the time of his disappearance, he was 23 year old. He was a white male with brown hair and hazel eyes. He was around 5 foot 10 inches tall and weighed about 180 pounds. Edward is missing one of his teeth and one of his front teeth is chipped. He has the following tattoos. He has the number 13 on his right arm. He has a set of praying hands on his left hand and the name Tasha in cursive writing on the left side of his neck. He was last seen wearing a yellow West Virginia sweatshirt and black nylon pants. If you have any information in this case, please contact the West Virginia State Police at 304-792-7200. This is the story of another missing woman from West Virginia. And she went missing from Beckley, West Virginia. Now, this story is dated 2016. This is the story of Tammy Jean Daniel. Tammy Jean Daniel's parents dropped her off at her Stanifer home one night nearly 30 years ago. 
It was the last time they or anyone heard from her. It was June 2, 1987, and Tammy had been hanging out at the El Cid Club in Beckley. Tammy's parents, Jeff and Norma, picked her up at around 3 o'clock in the morning and drove her back to her trailer. The door was locked, so Tammy told them that she would stay outside in a tent. That was the last time that they ever saw her. They went back by her home the next morning, but Tammy wasn't there. Her husband, Ronald Jean Daniel, said he asked her to leave and that he didn't know where she went. Several hours passed, and Tammy still has not had not been heard from. Four days later, Tammy's parents filed a missing person report. Detectives spoke with their neighbors and learned that something had earned a search warrant. One of the neighbors said Tammy's husband had borrowed a vacuum cleaner, and when he returned it, he, they said that it smelled terrible and it had blood on it. Um, they gave it over to the police. The police tested it, tested it, and it did test positive for blood. After searching the home, detectives found what they believed to be blood stains, and the husband could not explain how these blood stains got in the bedroom. Tammy's family acted several years ago to have a death certificate issued, but the case remains open. There have been many attempts to find her body. The husband was considered a person of interest in the case, and an indictment was brought against him in 1988. So they're saying that the man that they had on their staff or who they used in the lab, the man named Fred Zane, he was a body fluid scientist. Now, he worked on this case, and, it, and later he was um, found to be using flawed methods. So they're saying that he falsified lab results and reported impossible results. So police are saying this makes their case a little bit harder to prove because it's possible that the DNA evidence or the blood and, and that type of thing that he was a part of um, in this investigation may not have been accurate. Um, Tammy Daniel was last seen June 2nd, 1987. She graduated from Woodrow Wilson High School in 1980. She was married to her husband, Ronald Jean Daniel, for a year and a half before her disappearance. She had been described as a sweet, beautiful young woman. She was born October the 20th, 1962, and at the time of her disappearance, she was 5'7", 130 pounds, with brown hair. She was 24 years old at the time of her disappearance. Now, the timeline for Tammy's disappearance is she had gone out to this El Cid club her parents picked her up at around 3 o'clock in the morning and gave her a ride home. Her parents wanted her to go back home with them, and they, when they arrived at the trailer, they claimed that this husband was home, but that he wouldn't come to the door. And she didn't want to knock on the door and wake him up and cause this argument, so she just told her parents, go on home, I'll be fine, I'll go out here and sleep in this tent, according to the neighbors. He borrowed this vacuum cleaner and brought it back, and it had a, a horrible smell, and it had blood on it. So, like, like most mothers, Norma Hensdale remembers the first time she saw her daughter. On October the 15th, 1962, 
The baby was born, and she was a beautiful blue-eyed baby girl. It was an especially hard labor. Her family first thought to call her Robin, but then they thought about that and decided that they would name her Tammy. Her mother says she also remembers the last time she ever saw her daughter, which was June the 2nd, 1987. Tammy had been married to her husband for just a little over a year and a half. They were living with they were living in a mobile home in Staniford, West Virginia. And once again, her mother said, please just come home with us. She said, no, I'll be okay. The mother describes that the trailer was dark. There were no lights on inside. And her mother said, I will go knock on the door and wake Jean up. And her daughter said, you better not. She said, I'll just sleep in the tent. So by her saying, you better not, she knew that her husband had some violent tendencies or was quick to anger, maybe. and She just didn't want to deal with him. As they drove away, her mother said she looked back at Tammy, and Tammy was sitting on the trailer steps. She hadn't gone to get into a tent. She was still sitting outside the door of the trailer, and she was wearing a black leather jacket, a black t-shirt, and blue jeans. It was the last time that she would ever see her daughter. She says, we drove up the road out of sight, and I told him to stop the truck. I was going to get out and walk back. She said she knew that she wouldn't be able to sleep when she got home that night from worry and that her daughter was outside sleeping in a tent. So her husband drove a little bit out of sight of the trailer, turned off the headlights. She got out and began to walk back. She said, as I got closer to the trailer, I could hear what sounded like the storm door closing. She said, I looked at the trailer. I looked all around the outside of the trailer, but Tammy was not there. So she just assumed that she went on inside. This made her feel a little bit more at ease, knowing that her daughter was not outside sleeping in the yard. And she went ahead and went back to the truck, and she and her husband went ahead and returned home that night. And she says that, you know, this has haunted her because she knows that whatever happened to her daughter happened probably very soon after they left. According to police, Tammy has been declared legally dead, but they are still searching for her body. Her husband was indicted for murder in the months following her disappearance, but the indictment was later dismissed due to insufficient evidence. And to the police, there have never, there's never been any activity on her social security card, social security number, uh, no doctor's offices or anything like that have ever reported her ever having come into their, you know, clinics or hospitals. There's just been no sign of her, and they know that she is dead. Her mother knew that she was dead within days after her disappearance. They returned to the trailer and spoke to her husband, and he told them, that she had come inside the trailer that night. They'd had a little bit of an argument, and he asked her to leave. He told them that it, when she came home, that he would call, have her call them. Um, she hadn't called them after several days, so the, fam the mother and the father went back to the trailer, and when they got there, she said there was a two-tone van parked outside the trailer, but there was no sign of Tammy. According to police, a couple who lived next door reported that he, the husband, had borrowed their vacuum cleaner three days after Tammy's disappearance. Um, he brought it back, and when they tried to use the vacuum cleaner, they noticed this horrible smell coming out of it. 
and they took it apart and got to look and then she said it was just covered in this sticky substance. When the police came to start looking for Tammy and they were in the area in the neighborhood, they let the police know about this vacuum cleaner and they turned it over to them and they said that the blood matched Tammy's blood type. They obtained a search warrant for the trailer, but everything in the trailer had been removed except for a couch. They found a stain on a bedroom carpet that they believe was blood. They took the carpet up and the stain went all the way through the padding to the floor. He denied any involvement in Tammy's disappearance and he said that this wasn't the first time that she had run off and that he was just fed up with her coming home drunk late at night and told her to leave. Now, in January of 1989, he was involved in another incident where he was convicted of shooting a man named Walter Morgan. So on July the 8th, 1988, Ronald Jean Daniel... Ronald Eugene Daniel, who went by the name Gene, had gone to a bar called Legends Nightclub in Daniels, West Virginia. He had gone there with a couple of friends. There at the bar were two men named Jimmy Torrance and Cecil Miller. They were they arrived in a van with it was Jimmy Torrance, Cecil Mi Miller, and a sixteen year old named Timmy. I think this was one of the men's brother a man named Bobby Goodson, a man named Aaron Bolin, Cecil Miller, and Walter Dell Morgan. They had been drinking and smoking marijuana before arriving at the bar. Now, Daniel, Ronald Eugene Daniel, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Gene here, Gene and Torrance knew each other and met up in the club that night and began to have some drinks together. When the club closed... Gene exited the bar with Jimmy Torrance. At that time, they got into a fist fight with two other men known as the Patton Brothers. Patton, P-A-T-T-O-N. So they had this argument in the parking lot for whatever reason, and they got into a fist fight, and Eugene was injured in the fight after being hit in the head. He claimed that he became dazed from the beating. After the fight was over... Jimmy Torrance offered Gene a ride home. They all climbed into this van with Bobby Lane and an unknown woman, who was also, uh, at, they were also given her a ride home. At this point, the facts become hazy. Gene testified at trial that he did not remember getting in the van and he didn't remember speaking to anyone in the van, but says that he woke up in the front passenger seat and there were several people in the van that he didn't know. He stated he didn't know if they were the men who had beat him up and that he didn't trust Jimmy Torrance. He says having been beaten that he was confused and became suspicious of this Jimmy Torrance. He pulled out a gun and put it to Jimmy Torrance's head and told him to drive to 93 to the police station. And he claims that several people were coming towards him in a threatening manner in the van and that he aimed his gun, allegedly fired three shots to try to scare them away. Two of the three shots hit Walter Morgan in the chest and Morgan died as a result of these shots. The third bullet hit Cecil Miller in the arm and it was not a serious injury. The van came to a stop and the remaining passengers exited the van. This Cecil Miller um, quickly slipped out after the shots were fired. Sometime after the van left the scene, an ambulance was called for Morgan, but he died shortly after they arrived. Let me reread that just to make sure I got that right. Two of the three shots hit Walter Morgan in the chest. Morgan later died. The third bullet hit Cecil Miller in the arm, which is not 
a serious injury. The van came to a stop, and all of the passengers exited except Miller. Sometime after the van left the scene, an ambulance was called for Morgan, who died shortly after they arrived. Um, Daniel then again put the gun to Jimmy Torrance's head and told him to drive to a police station. However, he directed Torrance to drive the opposite direction. Jimmy Torrance eventually stopped the van upon seeing a police cruiser sitting beside of the road. Daniel exited the van. This is Gene Daniel exited the van with the gun still to Jimmy Torrance's head. However, um, he handed the gun over to the police and told them that he had been attacked. The officer searched the van and found uh, marijuana and a bag of LSD. Oddly, no drug screen was performed on Jane Daniel, although one was performed on Jimmy Torrance, who tested positive for alcohol and marijuana. After they had gotten into this fight with these other two men, they had got into the van and were headed home when Daniel pulled out a gun and put it to his head and told him to take him to the police station. Jimmy Torrance stated that he began to drive in that direction, but then the shots were fired and he said that he didn't believe anyone in the van had done anything to cause this, that he thought that Gene Daniel was just paranoid, and um, he was mad at Morgan because he says that he didn't help him during this fist fight. And this is what he believes led to the shooting, is that he was mad at Morgan. So, But Gene Daniel was convicted of first-degree murder and malicious wounding. He received consecutive sentences of 10 years to life on the murder conviction and 3 to 10 years for the wounding. But to get back to Tammy Daniel, she's never been found. Her family believes and the, poli the police believe that she was probably murdered that night that her parents dropped her off at home. After they left, they believe that this Jean Daniel was awake and as soon as they left and he saw their car go out of sight, he opened the door and told Tammy to come inside. Or Tammy knocked on the door and he let her in, one or the other. But it is believed that she did go inside that night and that the murder took place in the bedroom because there were blood stains. He had tried to clean this up using a neighbor's vacuum cleaner that they later did turn over to the police, and it was found to have blood inside of it or um, inside the vacuum cleaner. They did arrest him and charge him with her murder, but they couldn't make it stick. And so, to this day, Tammy Daniel remains a missing person. If anyone has any information about Tammy Daniel's disappearance, you may contact the Raleigh County Sheriff's Office at 304-255-9300. Thanks for watching.